Good afternoon and welcome to the Relocation 101 Module 2, Parts 3 and 4. My name is Paula Hyman from the Ohio LTAP Center and again I'll be your technical support. Um, if you have questions just as this morning, please put those in the questions pod um, and our presenter will address your questions periodically. There are handouts in the, in the handout section, and if for some reason you are unable to download those, shoot me your email in that questions box, and I will send those to you. Thank you in advance for that, and I will pass things off to Ms. Patty Mormon. Patty? Well, good afternoon, and welcome back to Module 2. Today we are going to talk about the completion of the RE95s in the appraisal scoping. And then following that, we will be talking about the four required Federal Highway Relocation Notices and how ODOT meets this criteria. So at the end of this module, you will be able to describe an RE95 and its purpose, complete the RE95, match four of the Federal Highway Relocation Notices with their respective ODOT forms. So the RE95 is ODOT's property inventory classification form that is used to make project management decisions. This form, as we discussed earlier, is an integral part of the appraisal as well as the relocation functions. And it also protects the agency from possible duplication of payments. I think the, the importance of this form is often underrated. It's too often it is just quickly thrown together without much thought or investigation, without questions being asked, with too little detail. A project can be derailed because of identification of wrong ownership, items me being categorized incorrectly as either personal property or real property, or items just missed altogether and not even accounted for in the appraisal. The RE95 is often filled out during the pre-acquisition survey if there is relocation or prior, and always prior to, to the appraisal. If there's no relocation, often it is completed by acquisition. So the RE95 form identifies the improvements in the take area. It identifies the ownership of the improvements and knowledge of the classification of these improvements situated in the take areas and the ownership of these improvements, they assist the project managers to identify the rightful owners to ensure that the offers are made to the right person, to ensure that the fair market value is properly allocated, to ensure that the people eligible to receive the relocation benefits are identified, to determine if the improvements are personal property or if they're real property. This avoids the duplication of payments by ensuring that an item is not moved as a relocation item, but then also valued and paid for in the appraisal and the acquisition process. Now this form also provides a written agreement between the owners, the tenants, and the agency as do ownership of an item. And this helps avoid problems during the negotiation process. Now this information is important because improvements classified as real property are valued in the appraisal process. And the department then makes an offer to buy them in the acquisition process. But improvements that are classified as personal property are not considered in the appraisal process. They are moved as part of a relocation process and the displacee receives a move payment. The RE95 um, is in essence instructions to the appraiser to advise him of whether he is paying for an item or whether the item is going to be moved. So let's take a look at this form. This form consists of two pages. The first page has the project and the parcel information. 
And the second page has signatures. So let's look at the top of this form. The top portion is going to identify who is occupying the property and who is the owner of the property. You'll notice there's a separate line for each. Now up in the upper right, you're going to have your project information, your parcel number, your project ident identification number. And you're also going to give a brief description of the property type. Now in the example on here, it's identifying that we do have a combination property that, that is, has a, a residence owner occupied and a business tenant. So the, the lower section of page one identifies the real estate that the appraiser will pay for and also identifies certain items of personality that he will not pay for. It also clarifies who owns these items. You will note on this form, we have a tenant on this property that has both real estate and personal property. Now on the second page, this is the second page is for signatures. Now it's important to obtain the signatures of the owner, of a tenant, and as well as ODOT. Now often I will see an RE95 where there's only a fee owner signature, even though there is, is a tenant occupying the site. And this situation is, you know, where I see it the most is where there's a, there is a large ID sign and the owner will just automatically say, it's my sign, you don't need to contact the tenant. You always need to follow up and contact the tenant. This form is for the tenant to verify and acknowledge that it's the owner's sign or and for the owner to acknowledge it is or isn't the tenant's sign. So when there are real estate items that a tenant is owned, then there is an additional form that is called an RE56. And this needs to completed this is completed by the owner. On this form, the owner states that the tenant owns the fencing. This form instructs the appraiser, the review appraiser, to prepare an RE22-1 separating out the value of the fence. This is a very important form. This is the owner stating, it's okay, that's not my fence, I'm giving you permission to pay the tenant for that item of real estate. So let's look at the top part of this disclaimer form. You'll see, again, you have the project information, parcel, project identification up in the right hand, and then you have the owner's name. You are going to clearly, clearly identify what the item is, and then you're gonna, it clearly identifies who the appraiser is to pay for this item. Only the owner signs this form. The tenant does not sign this form. So ODOT's policy is that whenever there is a man-made structure in the take area, that there must be an RE95 on the parcel. So let's look at some of the common examples of when you would need to fill out an RE95. If you have any signs, buildings, sheds, garages, barns, spas, pools, and of course, fencing. Now, gen generally, uh, landscaping does not, is, does not need to be on an RE95. So what would you not need to include on an RE95? You would not need to include driveways, patios, decks, sidewalks, septic systems, and or leach fields. These are items that yeah, you know go with the, go with the property. 
um, there's there's they're part they are just part of the part of the property not a um, you don't need to identify them as a separate line item on an RE95. So what happens if the owner or the occupant of the property refuses to sign the RE95? So if it's just the owner of the property and you do not have a tenant, then what you're going to do is you are going to note on there the, the date and the time that you inspected the property and you will then put a notation that the owner refused to sign. Now, if you have a tenant on this property and an owner and they are disputing ownership of any items, then you've got a problem. Um, usually, if there is a, a if they are disputing any items, this parcel usually is going to get filed for appropriation. If the RE95 needs to be updated at a later date, then you need to create a new RE95 with new signatures and with new dates. So let's talk about the, the most commonly missed items that are left off of RE95s. So cars at car dealerships, auto repair businesses, used car sales that are located in temporary take areas and need moved out of the way during construction. These cars are a personal property item and they need to be they need to be mentioned on the RE95 and you also need to determine who owns the vehicles within city limits you may find newspaper boxes benches and residential areas you may find wishing wells and other landscaping items you know other than you know we're uh, we're not talking about like uh, flower beds mulch, the, uh, those you would not mention. But other yeah, decorative landscaping items that can be picked up and moved. Signs. There are several categories to look for for signs. You have portable signs. Those are the kind that have the changeable lettering. Sometimes they're on wheels. Sometimes they're not, but they're still portable and they can be pulled back. Those are personal property. You have billboards. Billboards are real estate. And more and more often I see signs owned by, um, by a franchise that state they cannot sell the sign and they can't sell the sign face to ODOT due to contra contractual agreements with the corporate offices. These become a personal property move, usually the sign face only, but sometimes the pole if it can be reused. So when it comes to signs, you need to ask a lot of questions. You know, you need to ask, especially if there's a tenant on site, what part of the sign does the owner own? What part does the tenant own? And you need to find out if there are any restrictions because of a franchise. You know, some of the companies that have these franchise agreements are Aldi's, Wendy's, um, John Deere, uh, car dealerships, you know, the list, it seems like the list keeps growing as to uh, which of these companies have franchise. Add McDonald's in there. So when it comes to the signs, you need to ask a lot of questions. A lot of times the owner will own the big sign, but the tenant owns just the panel. So if that's the case, those have to be separated out and you have to indicate that on the RE95. And you have to get the signature of the tenant. Don't forget that. A new item we're seeing are food trucks. You know, which category this will fall in depends on the circumstances of each food truck. You know, I've seen food trucks where they simply have a cord that plugs in. I've seen others where they're actually um, wired in 
to the building and they and then they will also have a electric sign that's also wired in that's on on uh, in concrete so it de you have to ask the questions when you come across these items when it comes to signs it's very important to be very descriptive you know are they um, are they double faced are they single faced are they electric and one thing that's missed a lot with signs are do they have the do they have floodlights that need that also um, need to be paid for. The most common missed item that I see that not only is missed by the person who completes the RE95, it's usually also missed by the appraiser and missed by the reviewer, are sprinklers. You know, you need to walk the front of that property, especially in the businesses, and look for the sprinkler heads. You need to ask the question, do you have a sprinkler system out front? So the relocation program reverses for the actual, reasonable, and the necessary costs in the move of only personal property. So the appraisal in the R95 need to be checked to to determine which items will be moved and which items will be acquired with the property. And don't assume that they agree. Even though the, the RE95 goes to the appraiser and it becomes part of that appraisal, he sometimes he if if he doesn't agree, he goes ahead and pays for something. Um, so you you need to check. You need to check them against each other and make sure before you create a relocation parcel that they match. What is, you need to make sure the appraisal is not paying for something that, that you intended to pay to move. So the RE95 is a very important tool for the appraiser and the review appraiser. It will be, it, as I said, it will become part of that appraisal. I mean, literally, a copy of it is in that appraisal. It is also utilized by the review appraiser when he needs to create, create the RE22-1, which is, uh, we talked about the RE56 disclaimer. If there is an RE, RE56 disclaimer forwarded to the appraiser and the review appraiser, that is that is his clue that he needs to separate out that value and we have a third party owner. The most common the most common item that you see for an RE22-1 where the value is separated out is signs. However, the appraiser will also use this form for direction to to separate out the values on items such as um, pole barns, sheds, swimming pools that uh, may be ex extracted from the fair market value when the relocation agent needs to prepare a typical home site valuation. And a, we will discuss a typical home site valuation in much more detail in some of the later modules. That is a tool used in um, determining a replacement housing payment. So real property is generally defined as whatever is erected or growing or affixed to the land. Now fixtures are defined as an article that was once personal property, but has since been installed in or attached to the land or building in a rather permanent manner to, so that it is regarded in law as part of the real estate. So an example of the fixture, if you look at the, the photo on this slide, you know, a hot tub initially would be seen as personal property. However, you know, once once it is 
installed. And once you build that deck around that hot tub, it's now a fixture, it's now considered real estate. So the RE95 is also going to be used um, to advise the appraiser of the category of a mobile home. If it is determined to be real estate, then he will need to put a value on it. He will also need to know if it is owned by the landowner or if it's owned by a tenant. So what are the factors that you're gonna look at to decide whether you're going to categorize this as personal property or real estate, where well, you're gonna look at the age. A lot of times mobile home parks will not allow any mobile homes over 10 years old. So if it's personal property, you, you may not have a place to put it. You're gonna look at the condition. You know, Some of these mobile homes are in such a condition that if you try to move them, it will do more damage. And then you're gonna look at any attachments. If you look at some of these photos, you'll see that they now have built on attachments, um, attachments that are considered permanent. You're gonna look at the degree of difficulty and the extent of loss in, in moving. You're going to check to see, does it still have the wheels and the chassis underneath? And you're also gonna check with the auditor's office to see if it's if it is still registered as if it's registered as a personal property or if a if it is now a real estate item. So personal property is general generally defined as everything that is subject to ownership which is not real property. So the the term is applied to the property of a personable personal or movable nature. So personal property can be removed without any serious injury to the real estate or the item itself. And personal property is not appraised by the agency. It is not part of the acquisition process. Instead, relocation assistance re reimburses the owner of the personal property for the actual necessary and reasonable costs of the property. For example, if you have a built-in medicine cabinet, if removed, if it would leave a big hole in the wall, it would thus be classified as real estate. However, compare that to just a mirror hanging on the wall on, that would only leave a hook, that would be considered personal property. Now what's a little more difficult is trade fixtures. Trade fixtures are generally described as equipment or personal property which a tenant installs for business purposes. A tenant is allowed to remove trade fixtures before a lease ends unless a written document such as a lease expressly forbids it. So if you have a tenant, business, you always want to ask for a copy of the lease. You need to see what the lease says about items installed by the tenant. So depending on the standard test for realty versus personality, trade fixtures may be classified as real property or personal property. If they're classified as real property, they are treated as tenant-owned improvements and they are purchased as real estate. Again, you would use the RE56 for the owner to acknowledge that the tenant does own that improvement. If trade fixtures are classified as personal property, then the owner of the trade fixture will be reimbursed for the actual reasonable and necessary costs to move the item. Now it's very important that all the trade fixtures are identified as either real or personal property 
and individually listed on the RE95 prior to the appraisal process. And it's also very important that the owner and the tenant agree as to who owns that item. You know, we currently have a dispute for a Rally's restaurant where the owner of the Rally's says everything's his, the landowner says everything's his. So on this case, you're not going to get a written agreement in your RE95 and now you have disputed items that will probably need to be decided in court. So let's talk about the, the test for realty versus personality. So when you're looking at the items and trying to decide if you have something that you're going to put in the category of real estate or something that you're going to put in the category of personality or personal property, these are the questions that you should be asking. So what is the nature of the property? You know, a house by its nature is real property. Trees and shrubs are real property. Um, so what's the manner of, of the annexation? If an item is attached permanently to the real estate, it becomes real property. If an item is attached in such a way that it can be removed with little effort, it is most likely personal property the purpose of which the annexation is made. So light fixtures are installed to light the real property and therefore become part of the real property. However, a lamp would be considered personal property and we would pay to move it. So the intention of the annexing party to make the property part of the real estate. So if you look at, again, the hot tub, the intention when the deck is built around that hot tub is that the property owner is not taking it with them. The degree and difficulty and the extent of any loss involved in removing the property from the realty. Again, once the deck is built around that hot tub, to remove the deck, you're going to cause considerable damage. The damage to the severed property, which removal would cause. So that supports that the hot tub is definitely real estate. You know, gazebos are kind of, um, you know, something that, you need to look closely, you know, depending, you know, there are some gazebos that are on um, block, you know, concrete. There are some smaller ones that can easily be lifted and moved. Um, so each item, you have an item like that, you need to look to see how is it, how is it, um, you know, how is it attached to the, to the ground? What is the intent? Okay, so we have our first knowledge check. Okay, first question. The purpose of the RE95 is to Okay, so the purpose of the RE9 is, RE95 is to A, identify Im improvements in the take area, B, categorize improvements as real or personal T, and C, identify ownership of improvements, D, all of the above. And the answer is all of the above. Okay, question two. Okay, billboards are considered a business trade fixture 
and they are re relocated as personal personality. True or false? Okay, and the answer is false. Billboards are always real estate. Now, billboards do become a relocation parcel, but only because the landowner or the, the billboard owner does qualify for biz, business benefits, but the billboard itself is always real estate. Question number three. Improvements that should be listed on the RE95 include A patios, B septic systems, C, decks, D, fencing. And the only uh, correct one is fencing. The other three um, are, are considered part of, the, part of the property. They do not need um, designated out separately. Are there any questions concerning the RE95s before we move on to relocation notices? Okay, if not, we'll keep going. So the Uniform Act and federal regulations require that persons who are being displaced provide are provided certain information that they will need to minimize the disruption of moving and maximize the likelihood of a successful relocation. So much of this information is contained in a series of notices from the displacing agency to the, the displaced person or the business. So this information must be in writing um, it must be an easily understood language. Often um, it may be appropriate for the information to be provided in a foreign language, um, as well as hire an interpreters as necessary. These notices must be delivered either in person or by certified mail. And at ODOT, they need to be in person unless otherwise approved. Each notice should contain the name and the telephone number of the person who can be contacted for answers and questions. And next we're gonna discuss each of these federal notices in detail. So the first notice is the general information notice. So one of the most effective ways to convey this information required in this notice is the use of the relocation brochure. And we talked a little bit about the brochure this morning, and you do have a copy um, in your handouts. There is a brochure for residential, and there is a different one for non-residential. Now, the, these, re these brochures, mostly are given at the pre-acquisition survey during the personal interview. Although they can also be handed out at public information meetings, um, they can be handed out at other times as, as needed. And it is, it is a well-written brochure. And as I encouraged you this morning, if you have not read what, these brochures, or if you haven't looked at them in a long time, I really encourage you to you know, start at the beginning and go through the brochures so you are familiar with all the information in them. So just to touch again on 
what you're going to find in these brochures. It's going to notify the person that he or she may be displaced by the project. It's going to instruct them that they should not move immediately, or if they do, they will jeopardize their, assist, their potential assistance. It's going to give them the assurance that they're not going to be required to move unless the agency has made at least one comparable, decent, safe, and sanitary replacement dwelling available. It's going to give them assurance that they won't be required to move for at least 90 days. It's, it's going to um, provide information concerning the kinds of advisory services that the agency is going to provide, that we're going to assist them with their move, we're going to provide referrals for replacement housing, we're going to help with the filing of all the claims and provide whatever other assistance is needed. It also gives a description of the relocation payments that will be available to assist them with the cost of the move, the eligibility requirements for the payments, and the information on how to obtain them. It also advises them that they do have the right to appeal any of the determinations that are made by the relocation agent. So at ODOT, we, we also have a form for everything. So we have what we call a receipt of brochure. Whenever you deliver this relocation brochure, you are, are to seek the displacee's signature on the form REBRO, which is receipt of brochure. This receipt just confirms for our file that we did meet the requirement of providing the general information notice. So let's talk about the notice of relocation eligibility. This is another key step in the relocation process. The relocation offer letter it actually has multiple formats depending on the eligibility of the person being displaced. We have a letter for an owner occupant, for a residential parcel, we have a we have a letter for a tenant. We have letter for letters for businesses. We also have one for personal property when we're not displacing a person or a business, just moving personal property. Now the notice should be delivered at the initiation of negotiations to acquire the property wherever where the person lives or conducts a business. The date on which this occurs generally is the date when the property owner is receiving the written offer to buy the property and is stating the amount of just compensation. So the, if you are an owner occupant, you will be receiving this letter on the day you receive the offer to purchase the property. Now, if you are a tenant occupant, the relocation agent does have up to seven days to give this letter. The regulations require that the notice be provided promptly to the persons being displaced, which is why if they're an owner, the letter is given at the same on the same date. With a tenant, a little a little more time is allowed so that the offer can be made to the owner and then a follow-up offer later made to a tenant. So in, in the letter, there is what we call a 90-day notice. And when, pe when people to be displaced have received a 90-day notice, they know they will have at least that much time to find a replacement dwelling and a business site. This 90-day notice is a notice, it's a, it's a basic protection, it's for the displaced person, but it's easily and often misunderstood. This clause, and, and this is something as a relocation agent, 
you probably will have to repeat more than more than once. This is not stating that they have 90 days and they need to be moved. It's stating that we cannot ask them to move for at least 90 days. Now, what one one thing that could affect this 90-day notice is the requirement for making available comparable replacement housing. You know, the 90-day notice, the 90-day clock, may not begin until the agency has made available at least one, or where where possible, three comparable replacement dwellings. So for an owner occupant of a home, this uh, the 90 days, the clock for the 90 days only starts ticking once they have been presented an offer and that is based on comparable dwellings being of being available. Finally, in some situations, very rare, they may be the agency may be required to move persons with less than 90 days advance notice. Now, examples of these would be uh, health, safety, or other reasons which make 90 days not impractical. An example would be occasionally uh, more down in Southern Ohio, you know, there may be um, a landslide or something that is jeopardizing the safety of the occupants of a home. Um, you know, that, uh, the priority there would be moving the family out, you know, into a, um, a safe environment. And so the, the, the 90 days may not come into play. An agency's need for land or a project schedule, that is not sufficient reason for failing to meet the 90 day notice. Um, the reason needs to be as stated before, for health or sa safety reasons. So the relocation notice of intent to acquire, um, not to be confused with our um, NIAGFO offer. Um, this explains to the recipient that the agency intends to acquire to acquire the property. Uh, this letter would be given. We're not ready to. Um, we're not ready to present the offer letter that, that has the 90 days in it. Um, but for uh, good reason, we're, we're going to go ahead and and we're going to make them eligible for relocation. Now at ODOT, this notice is only issued with central office section managers prior written approval. An agency will usually deliver this notice when an offer to acquire is imminent, but the agency needs to go forward with the relocation offer before the offer can be made. This notice allows the agency to establish the displaced person's eligibility for relocation assistance prior to actually um, the initiation of negotiations. For example, let's say we have a um, we have a we are going to acquire a multi-tenant residential property which has 50 units in an apartment building. Rather than waiting until it is ready to make an offer to the owner, the agency may issue a notice of intent to acquire to all the tenants, which constitutes the initiation of negotiations and establishes each displaced person's eligibility for relocation. This may provide the agency with the lead time necessary to complete all the relocations on time. Now note that this will create vacancies in the subject property, which may upset the owner landlord, and the agency may want to seek a protective leasing arrangement 
with the fee owner to present subsequent displaced persons. So we are ready for our next knowledge check. First question, the general information notice is that also known as? A, notice of intent to acquire. B, 90-day notice. C, relocation brochure, or D, notice of relocation eligibility? And the answer is C, the relocation brochure. Um, and with the signed brochure receipt, that confirms that we have met the, the requirement for a general information notice. Okay, we're ready for question number two. The notice of relocation eligibility is given at A, the pre-acquisition interview, B, at the initiation of negotiations, C, at the time of the appraisal inspection, or D, none of the above? And the answer is B, at the initiation of negotiations. And question three. The relocation offer letter can be personal delivered or mailed by U.S. mail. True or false? And the answer is false. I mean, the letter the letter can be mailed, but it ha if if it is approved to be mailed. It has to be by certified mail, not regular U.S. mail. Okay, so let's go over our learning outcomes. So when is the ideal time to conduct relocation planning? It's in the early stages of the project development during the environmental assessment stage. So what are the differences between the conceptual report and the pre-acquisition survey report? The conceptual report is the early planning where you are not making direct contact with any of the potential displaces. You probably have multiple alignments and it becomes part of the environmental document. The pre-acquisition survey and report, you are actually conducting personal interviews. You have one alignment, and you are you are you are gathering much more detailed information, and you're coming up with your relocation plan. So, what is an RE95, and what is its purpose? The RE95 is ODOT's property inventory classification form. It de delineates between real property and personal property. It identifies who owns what. It is a critical tool for the project managers for scoping the appraisers. It's also a critical tool for determining 
what relocation is going to move and what appraisal is going to pay for. So let's talk about the general notices. The general information notice is ODOT's brochure, provides general information about the project and the relocation program. The notice of eligibility, which is ODOT's offer letter, informs the persons that they will be displaced by the project and may be eligible for certain relocation assistance. The 90-day notice assures the displacees they will have a minimum of 90 days to move. The relocation notice of intent to acquire allows the agency to make a person eligible for relocation assistance prior to the initiation of negotiations. So that completes parts three and four of module two. Um, you, you will receive an, an email with the instructions on how to access the quiz. You need, to, you need a score of 70% or better to pass the quiz. You need to complete that quiz before moving on to module three. If you have not completed the quiz for module one, you also need to go back and complete the quiz for module one. And I do want to emphasize again, if you're taking this course for credit to get approved in relocation, it's mandatory that you do attend all the modules, that you do participate, that you do complete all the quizzes. Um, if you are, um, if you're not participating in the modules and you're not, and you're not completing the quizzes, um, you will not get credit for this class. So do we have any questions before um, we end this module? Okay, we're, we're seeing no questions. If you have any questions afterwards, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Um, other than that, I hope to see you all back for module three.